Um, I'm Celia King, and I currently serve on the board of the Hypersomnia Foundation. And we are fortunate to have with us this morning our next speaker, Dr. Kiran Maski, um, who is with us, and I am privileged to introduce her to you um, as she prepares to serve, uh, share her work um, in pediatric hypersomnia disorders. Dr. Maskey is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and a child neurologist and, and sleep medicine specialist at Boston Children's Hospital. She runs the Neurology Sleep Clinic at BCH and is the assistant program director for the Child Neurology Residency. Dr. Maskey has created a hypersomnia clinic at BCH where she sees children and young adults with central nervous systems hypersomnia conditions from all over the world. Dr. Maskey's research includes work on one of the great challenges in our community, improving our ability to have accurate diagnosis of narcolepsy, idiopathic hypersomnia, and related disorders. Um, her research has been focused on pediatric narcolepsy, and um, we are so pleased that she's here to share her research with us. Dr. Maskey. So these are my disclosures, thank you very much. Um, so I'll be talking today about narcolepsy uh, predominantly, but very interested in idiopathic hypersomnia, and this is a very much a problem in the pediatric community as well. So I wanted to highlight some of these challenges that we have in the pediatric community um, because I think actually idiopathic hypersomnia for many actually starts before age 18. Um, but then we'll focus mostly on some of the biomarkers that help with diagnosis. So um, in terms of uh, this pediatric onset, this is better characterized in narcolepsy type 1 where the peak onset of narcolepsy typically is between 10 and 20 years. Up to 50% of people who are actually diagnosed as adults actually recall that their symptoms began as childhood um, symptoms. Um, and so it really gets to this diagnostic delay problem. And we know that um, uh, patients with, uh, with, who had symptom onset before age 18 um, were, were more typically um, had this delayed diagnosis. So in terms of other uh, idiopathic hypersomnia, um, it's really not known how many of the symptoms actually began before age 18 years. But we did a survey with an organization called Unite Narcolepsy, which was a consortium of various organizations like Wake Up Narcolepsy and Narcolepsy Network um, and Project Sleep. And in this um, survey, people who reported other hypersomnia disorders, which included idiopathic hypersomnia, typically did say, about 50% of them did say that symptom onset was actually before age 18 years. So in terms of this diagnostic delay problem, in this same survey, we looked at whether, um, is this still a problem? Some of this data was old from the 1990s. And what we found is in a patient population of over 1,400 patients, that about 50% of them still said it took over five years for them to get a diagnosis. And in terms of what contributed to that was that the symptoms began in the pediatric um, ages, and so no one really recognized it, or they didn't have cataplexy, a very recognizable symptom or specific symptom of narcolepsy. And I'll just highlight that nearly a third of these patients, it took over 10 years. So that means a lot of these kids just sort of lost their childhood, had a significant academic failure before their symptoms were even recognized. So common reasons for uh, misdiagnosis in the pediatric population are that they are, the symptoms can look like other, other conditions, like mental health problems. Oh, you're just depressed, you're fatigued, you're sleepy. Um, the cataplexy can be mistaken for epilepsy. Um, and the nocturnal sleep disruptions can be labeled as insomnia. You're not sleeping well, that's why you're sleepy. And then, um, 39% of patients, or uh, sorry, primary care physicians who were surveyed couldn't even tell you <laughs> any of the core symptoms of narcolepsy, uh, which certainly is a problem because obviously this is where patients are first going to for their diagnosis. Um, I think a big problem is that so many kids are sleepy these days in classes. So up to 25% of kids are actually falling asleep in a regular school day. And a lot of this has to do with early school start time. So this problem links back to very much public health issues. Um, and then another common thing is that oftentimes patients are misdiagnosed with ADHD, especially in kids 
sleepiness presents as irritability or behavior issues or hyperactivity or impulsive issues, guess what they get treated with? Stimulant medications. And so they basically look a little better. They do better for a period of time. Or they're treated for depression, so they're started on SSRI medications, which improve some of the cataplexy and some of the other more specific symptoms of narcolepsy that would have otherwise been recognized. Well, what about um, other hypersomnia conditions? Well, there's a high rate of misdiagnosis in this group as well as depression, obstructive sleep apnea, or narcolepsy. And based on that survey I mentioned, about 32% of um, respondents reported that it took them over five years to get an accurate diagnosis. So um, I won't go into this too much, but we know that in terms of narcolepsy, we really are dependent on this multiple sleep latency test. Um, and so this is basically the test that we are using. If you have a mean sleep latency of eight minutes or less and two or more sleep onset REM periods, you fit the diagnosis of narcolepsy. And the point I want to make here is we really are not looking at the nocturnal sleep study that's done prior for additional biomarkers. In terms of idiopathic hypersomnia, the rooms, rules are a little bit more relaxed, but still questionable. Um, you have to have this mean sleep latency value of less than eight minutes, or you can have actigraphy showing that on average you fall asleep or sleep for a period of over 11 hours, or they can do an extended polysomnogram where they just run the overnight sleep study for up to 24 hours and show that you sleep this continuous period of 11 hours. So this goes into these diagnoses. But the question has really been um, how valid or reliable um, is this MSLT for diagnosis? And at least for narcolepsy, um, it's always been thought that this is a pretty um, valid test, and it is, but there are false negatives. So in population-based studies, up to 4% had none of these abnormal REM periods, and an additional 6% had only one, meaning that there was a 10% false negative rate. In another study called the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study, this is you know, otherwise healthy people, 7% um, of that population had these multiple sleep onset REM periods. Now most of these people had shift work, so they sort of had abnormal times of their sleep. Um, and 22% had this uh, mean sleep latency of less than eight minutes, which would have meant that they would have been diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia, way higher than what we would expect. Um, so at least 3.4% of that population had a combination of two, so this would have been a false positive of, of about 4%. Now, we suspect that this is actually higher in the pediatric population. Um, and again, this is really due to that school start time issue, I think. Um, this is an old study done by Mary Carskadden, who does a lot of the work on sort of normal sleep times and uh, melatonin distribution and uh, a, a sort of a physiology of adolescents and children in their sleep. This was a study where they looked at patients, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, students who were graduating from ninth grade going to 10th grade. And in that time, their school start time started an hour earlier. And so they did two weeks of actigraphy with this change, and they also brought them in for like a 22-hour sleep study where they looked at sort of how much they slept. And what was interesting is these are the same uh, students. They just graduated one year to the next. Um, with that one hour's change, 16% uh, of them had multiple sleep onset REM periods during the day, and 48% of them had at least one. Um, and the average time it took them to fall asleep during the multiple sleep latency tests was eight and a half minutes. And this is something we really struggle with. So I suspect we actually have higher false positives in the pediatric uh, narcolepsy cases. Um, this may have been work that um, was mentioned yesterday from Lynn Marie Trotting and, and, and uh, the Rye Group, but basically this was a study where they looked at what's the reliability of this MSLT. If we did it once and we did it again, would we still get the same results? Um, and the results were striking. Anywhere from, for narcolepsy type 1, the reliability was only about 78 to 81 percent. Narcolepsy type 2 ranges anywhere from 18 to 47 percent, and IH is a striking 25 percent. So I think this really highlights, is there, are there additional tests that we can do to be really confident of diagnoses? Um, in pediatric narcolepsy or narcolepsy type 1, CSF hypocretin, so this is the chemical or the neuropeptide that's uh, diminished in patients with this specific condition. And we know that about 89% of these patients are low in hypocretin, that's measurable. That would be a perfect way of actually diagnosing that. 
But there's limitations to that too. You try telling that to a child and <laughs> they're not oftentimes gonna go for that. So that really limits our ability to make accurate diagnoses. Um, so we've really focused on what can we extract in terms of sleep biomarkers that are available on the clinical nocturnal sleep studies that people are already getting. Um, and if you're not familiar with this term, biomarkers are basically characteristics that are objectively measured that can indicate sort of a pathogenic process. And this can be a chemical, this could be some neurophysiology, this could be a structure in your brain, um, but it helps us understand sort of a disease state or outcome of it. And it's useful for diagnosis, it's useful for looking at who's gonna respond to a certain type of treatment or even long-term prognosis. So the idea is here is that maybe we could extract some of these sleep biomarkers from the nighttime study, use it with the MSLT to make the accurate diagnosis. So in terms of some of the um, biomarkers we've looked at, um, we're focused mostly on narcolepsy. And um, one common observation is that there's rapid transitions into REM sleep with narcolepsy. And that's for a biologic reason. Hypocretin basically regulates the ability to uh, go, to activate your REM on and REM off neurons. And so when it's lost, there's almost this REM on system. And so the REM sleep can intrude during wakeful periods and abnormal times during sleep. Um, so the nocturnal sleep onset REM period, this transition to go right from wakefulness or to end for uh, lighter sleep right into REM sleep is pretty rare actually. And when we look at that, 97% of uh, patients who have that finding actually have narcolepsy type one. But it's not very sensitive, only 50% of the patients actually have that. And we've, we found that it was also there in children's just as it was in adults. Um, people have also gone on to look at, okay, well, beyond that first um, transition into REM sleep, how um, specific is that? So, for instance, um, um, are in uh, going in from REM, uh, non-REM sleep or wakefulness into REM sleep. So you could just count the number of times that happens. And in this group's estimation, they found that about 100% of patients um, with narcolepsy would have findings, you know, or sorry, people who had these findings, 100% of them actually ended up having narcolepsy type one. You can't get any better than that. But it was only found in about 17% of patients. So it's really not a, again, a sensitive biomarker. And this just highlights, again, that physiology, that the orexin neurons or hypocretin neurons um, are really in, in charge of regulating this REM off system. So um, if you don't have orexin or low orexin or hypocretin levels, it means that you have a REM on system and you can get these abnormal transitions. And what we wanted to look at next is, okay, we know that these REM transitions are occurring, but does it actually change the physiology of REM sleep itself? So you may or may not know, but um, REM sleep is this very unique sleep stage where we have um, pretty active brain activity accounting for some of the dreams that we have, um, but actually we have no muscle tone or very low muscle tone during REM sleep, and that's a good thing. We wouldn't wanna get up and act out that dream that we were just having. Um, so we're actually almost functionally paralyzed during REM sleep, again, normal. And then we have these rapid eye movements that make our eyes go back and forth. And a common observation um, through history really is that people with narcolepsy seem to have normal tone during REM sleep. They don't have this paralysis. So um, this is basically a patient who has uh, narcolepsy. And if you just focus, sorry, uh, here. So unlike the last patient I just showed you, this patient has persistent chin tone all throughout their REM periods. And that's very abnormal. Um, that was tonic uh, increases, meaning that they had sustained chin tone, and this is phasic increasing, meaning that they actually have these bursts of activity that are occurring during their normal REM sleep. Um, so we wanted to know, is this potentially a good biomarker of pediatric narcolepsy? So we did this study where we basically looked at patients who, um, well, and the reason we did this patient is because this is sort of a, a well-described um, phenomenon. Uh, REM behavior disorder, meaning where you act out dreams during normal REM sleep, was reported in up to 20 to 36% of patients um, who were adults. And interestingly, 90% of patients who had uh, narcolepsy report 
had reportings of having REM without atonia. So when we were talking about sort of that sensitivity issue, if 90% of patients have it, we were expecting this to be a better biomarker than the sleep onset REM period. Um, and we also know that higher REM without atonia, again, that high chin tone during REM sleep, is associated with lower levels of hypocretin, so there's variability in that. So there's a lot of reasons to, to, for us to want to do this. So we looked at 40 drug-naive patients, um, 6 to 18, with, uh, who were coming in for a nocturnal sleep study and a multiple sleep latency test the next day. About 12 had narcolepsy type 1, 6 had narcolepsy type 2, 12 had idiopathic hypersomnia, and we had 11 controls. These were people who reported sleepiness but had normal testing. Um, and we scored their sleep um, based off of our standard sleep study guidelines. Um, we removed any artifacts, suppose they got up or moved around or had obstructive sleep apnea, we just didn't score that. And we did a sensitivity analysis here. So interesting, we found that 80% of patients would have met the diagnosis of REM without atonia based on the standard sleep study scoring. And that's because they're children. <laughs> they don't have mature brains. They have still some excitatory input to their spinal cords during sleep. And so they will have these little phasic bursts that sometimes um, you know, will reflect REM without atonia. So I think that's more of a message to our sleep society is not applying adult rules to pediatric um, studies. But in fact, we did find similar rates as reported in um, the adult populations. 20% of patients with narcolepsy type 1 and type 2 had REM behavior disorder. And this was really interesting. It wasn't violent as what's been reported um, in other conditions. It was more like pantomime behavior, like acting out a dream of writing on a chalkboard or hitting a ball or getting up and kicking a ball like a soccer ball. Um, so there was really actually no injury um, in, in our cases. But what we looked did find is that in narcolepsy type 1, um, that this REM without atonia is significantly higher than um, both the IH group and the narcolepsy um, and the control group. And I'll just highlight this again here. So basically we're looking at the median is much higher than the medians of the other two groups. So here and here. Um, but where we saw the most variability was actually that second group, this narcolepsy type 2 group. Um, some of those patients actually went on to go on to develop narcolepsy type 1, and they were the ones with the higher REM without atonia, where others just stayed stable. So that's, you know, I think when we talk about biomarkers, um, we have to think about, you know, the, whether these could be useful for prognosis as well as diagnosis. And at least in this population, because we saw so much REM without atonia in the narcolepsy type 2 group, we just lumped them together with the narcolepsy type 1 group. But for idiopathic hypersomnia, I would just point out that their sleep was very stable. We did not see, we actually saw very rare REM without atonia in this group at all um, compared to controls. And when we did the sensitivity sort of specificity analysis, um, we saw that uh, very similar to the nocturnal sleep onset REM period data, that the specificity of this finding was nearly 96%. But again, we only saw it in about 50%. So this is very similar to that data I showed you with the, with the sleep onset REM period. And it's probably because it's the same mechanisms controlling both. The hypocretin is lost, and so it's activated, or that REM off neurons are not being activated, and you're kind of like on this REM overdrive. So the next biomarker I'm going to focus on is, um, is the sleep-wake transitions. And we also know that in narcolepsy, hypocretin regulates sleep and wake stability. So these common transitions that are occurring during the night are when the hypocretin is lost. Um, and we call this symptom disrupted nighttime sleep. Um, and, and we wanted to see really how bad this was in children, or, or is this an accurate measurement? And I have to say, this came up because when I was talking to a colleague, um, I was telling them what I was working on, and they were like, oh, does that happen in kids? I never see it. And, I, and it really struck me because I feel like I always look at their EEG and I'm seeing this all the time. Um, so we looked into this. Um, the background on this would be that in the adult populations, this is a pretty robust biomarker. So if you count up the number of transitions, um, like the blue to the sleep stages here, um, you would get a very high index um, in adults where basically they were having on average somewhere between six to eight 
uh, wakings during the night, going right back to sleep during them every hour. Um, and that was significantly higher in the narcolepsy type 1 group compared to all the other hypersomnia groups and controls. Um, and they found that if you had an index of 3.9 wakings per hour, that 96% of patients with narcolepsy would have that type of finding. So this is, a, again, a very sensitive biomarker, but it wasn't very specific. They only found it in 31% of patients with narcolepsy. But they thought, okay, well, in combining these biomarkers, this could be really helpful. So again, we wanted to see, is this something that we're seeing in the, in the pediatric narcolepsy population? Um, and this kind of gets to a point that I was making to someone else earlier, that uh, basically we just took the data right from the sleep study. So you know the manual report that you guys get from your sleep studies, we just pulled the numbers right out of there. And we counted up the number of sleep-wake transitions. And when we did that, we found no differences between the narcolepsy type 1 group and the um, the controls or any other hypersomnia group. So really suggesting that maybe my colleague was right, disrupted nighttime sleep is not a problem in kids with narcolepsy. But again, you know, this may be a problem of were we underpowered or were the studies not scored accurately? I have to say, because I'm a neurologist, I'm always looking at the EEGs, and I can tell you that there's a lot of missed data where they're just not scoring because it's really hard to score brief waking periods constantly through the night. They're sort of, the scores that we use are, are very focused on respiratory. Um, or was my colleague right and, and sleep fragmentation or this nocturnal sleep's not a problem? So we went ahead and did this project, and this is a poster we're showing tomorrow, um, where we're looking at now 31 patients with narcolepsy compared to subjective sleepy patients. Again, these are patients with complaints of sleepiness but didn't have um, any of the test results that would put them in an IH category, for example. Um, and the average age of our population is about 12 to 13. Um, they've had symptoms for about two years. Um, there were no differences in females or males, and all of them are pretty sleepy. The narcolepsy patients a little bit more, and narcolepsy type 1 are more positive for this HLA haplotype, as expected. Um, and what we found is really there were no differences in their gross measures of sleep. Um, so things like sleep maintenance, how many times are you awake over versus the amount of time you're actually in bed, um, how long were you asleep for, um, the sleep stage distributions, the only thing that was abnormal was that the, the sleepy people with normal studies actually had lighter sleep, um, what we call non-REM stage two, and the patients with narcolepsy did have a higher arousal index, but that's not necessarily specific. We see that in almost all sleep disorders like obstructive sleep apnea. Um, but what we did in this study is we actually rescored the studies ourselves. So we took all their studies, we put it in a database, and we had scores rescored blinded to diagnosis. And when we did that, we found that the sleep-wake transition index was, was markedly higher in the pediatric narcolepsy patients compared to the control. So that's what you see in um, blue there. Um, and so uh, the index was, was higher. But the other thing that we did is we looked at whether transitions from sleep into not just wake, but lighter sleep, um, stage N1 sleep, was also, markedly, uh, was also higher. And we found that that was actually a better robust finding um, and definition of disrupted nighttime sleep. So really it's that disrupted nighttime sleep is this transitions from a stable sleep stage to an unstable sleep stage, and that may be a more accurate description. So this is sort of um, additional data characterizing this disrupted nighttime sleep, and these are survival curves. So these are basically plotting the percentage of, um, of of wake periods that are still there over time. And what this is really getting at is how stable or how long lasting are these wake periods. And in red, we have the patients with narcolepsy, and in blue, we have the patients, um, or the control patients. And you can see that the, the rate of decline in the red is going down much faster compared to those control patients. Um, meaning that their wake bouts are very short. So this is maybe the reason that these things get underscored is because they're so short that people aren't scoring them and patients may not even be recognizing it. 
And what's even really cool is in the mouse model of narcolepsy, this is from my colleague um, Tom Scammell, they found this with when hypocretin neurons are actually ablated, um, that from baseline to, to when the uh, ablation occurs, that the wake periods, um, they are able to not sustain as long wake periods uh, as well. Um, we wanted to look at how this, what this effect was on non-REM and REM sleep as well, and similar findings. So non-REM sleep in patients with narcolepsy is less stable than those of controls. Same thing with REM sleep. Um, so really what I'm trying to describe here is that in pediatric narcolepsy, they have a very unstable sleep pattern. Um, they have very short wake periods. They have frequent transitions from um, sleep into wake and in N1. And the consequence of that is that the periods of sleep are very short when they are getting it. So it really is this really novel description of a unique sleep fragmentation pattern that we're seeing. So, um, and this is, the, this is where I'm gonna leave you, but this is our preliminary data of how this really affects um, or, or is this a pot potential measure for patients with idiopathic hypersomnia? I think you've heard a couple of talks now that we really don't have objective biomarkers um, like a chemical or something for diagnosis. And so this is basically, uh, again, the survival plots, and we looked at 10 patients with narcolepsy type 2 in addition, and then idiopathic hypersomnia, 11 patients. Um, the narcolepsy type 2 are the yellow bar, and the IH patients are the purple bar. And I'm just going to summarize this because it's probably very hard to see. But what we found was that both IH patients and narcolepsy type 1 patients have these very short wake bouts through the night. Um, they're not as frequent as they are in the narcolepsy group, but they're very short. And that makes sense, right? When people wake up, they're able to return back to sleep in the IH population. But this was significantly different than the narcolepsy type 2 group. When they woke up, they were able to sustain wakefulness for a longer period of time. And this is relevant because some people want to put narcolepsy type 2 with IH and kind of lump them even further together. And this is really suggesting a physiology that, that's really different. When we looked at their non-REM sleep curves, we saw further differences. So in the narcolepsy type 1 group, as I just told you, their non-REM sleep, which is in red, um, it basically deteriorates very quickly, meaning that they have very unstable non-REM sleep. Whereas the IH population and the narcolepsy type 2 group have very stable non-REM sleep. So they have it even higher than the control population. I'm just going to point this out. It's almost a condition of overstable non-REM sleep. So these two curves are um, statistically different from the blue curve. Um, in contrast, REM sleep, um, the patients with IH had very similar REM sleep um, durations compared to the control group. Um, it was the narcolepsy type 2 that had overstable REM sleep. Uh, and again, I'm going to show this here. And the narcolepsy type 1 had sort of these short bouts. So this is narcolepsy type 2, and this is narcolepsy type 1. So just to sum that up, um, basically, narcolepsy type 1, very unstable sleep. Frequent short bouts of all stages, wake and various sleep stages. IH patients, short wake bouts, but almost this super stable non-REM sleep pattern. Um, and uh, re uh, narcolepsy type 2, normal wake bouts, long non-REM sleep, and long REM sleep. So to summarize all the biomarkers that I cover, the nocturnal sleep onset REM period um, is a very specific uh, marker to narcolepsy type 1, both children and adults. We found similar findings for REM without atonia. And this may be maybe a future biomarker that could further differentiate narcolepsy type 2 from IH patients. Disrupted nighttime sleep and pediatric narcolepsy. This is probably best defined as transitions from stable sleep to unstable sleep um, or non-REM stage 2 or REM into non-REM stage 1 or wake sleep. Um, these wake bouts were shorter compared to controls and other hypersomnia groups as well as the sleep itself um, bouts were shorter. And then wake and sleep bouts may be a useful objective measure to distinguish hypersomnia groups in the future. Um, in particular, the IH group has these short wake bouts. 
extra strong, long, st stable non-REM bouts, but normal REM bouts compared to controls. And I think this would be really interesting as a potential objective measure of uh, this sort of high GABA sensitivity or potentially um, a measure of who may be more responsive to flumazenol treatment, for instance. Um, and then narcolepsy type 2, I think there's a lot more variability in this uh, patient set. So some of the things that we have to do is get more patients with narcolepsy type 2. Maybe something like HLA typing would help us distinguish um, whether one is, they have physiology more like narcolepsy type 1 compared to IH, um, but would be interesting, I think. So take home points, um, central nervous system hypersomnias commonly affect kids. Um, diagnostic delays, big problem. This is basically very problematic in the pediatric population in particular, and misdiagnosis is very common. Um, the current diagnostic testing using the MSLT has problematic validity and reliability. This is probably more common and more problematic in the pediatric population, and possibly linking to sort of a uh, public health issue of early school start times, where normal healthy children are starting to look like hypersomnia conditions because of this problem. And then nocturnal sleep biomarkers, I think, can improve the diagnostic accuracy and serve as objective um, and specific measures for future treatments. Um, but this really, as I pointed out, relies on accurate sleep stage scoring. And I think the future really um, is bright if we could get large repositories of actual neurophysiology data to help us um, parse through. Um, and this is just a plug, um, you know, while we're doing this biomarkers research, we know that there's a lot of kids out there sitting in schools who are not diagnosed. And so we conducted a couple of focus groups and we asked simply patients, where did you first notice there was a problem or who did you wish knew that, you know, there was a problem in terms of your sleepiness? And uniformly, it was schools. You know, they were kind of, kind of knew that something was wrong and felt ignored, or they felt like the teachers didn't believe them or whatnot. So we've been working with our schools in Massachusetts to um, develop a pediatric hypersomnia tool. So when they see kids falling asleep, they would be able to distinguish between patients who are just sleepy because they didn't get enough sleep and someone who really has a chronic condition. Um, so we're looking for collaborators um, in various medical institutions to help us validate this. So these are my funding. We couldn't do anything without patients, of course. Um, I have a wonderful research staff who helps me with this scoring. They're probably chained to the readers now, rescoring all the studies, and our funding sources, in particular, Jazz, who funded our DNS study. Thank you.